I'm researching the role of Finnish forestry companies in Uruguay and it's fascinating because Uruguay is a country where Finland seems like a superpower because these companies have made the biggest investments in the history of the Republic of Uruguay. And there's a big debate in Uruguay. And on the one hand, you have claims by those who support the investments that they have been very careful about sustainability dimensions of the investments, which is to grow eucalyptus, to produce pulp cellulose in the biggest pulp mills of the world. And the critics say it's environmentally destructive and also claim that there's some kind of colonial or neocolonial relationship of power between the corporation and the Republic of Uruguay. So I'm looking at that constellation from many perspectives, but especially as a world politics person, I'm looking at investment protection rules and how these kinds of investments are often facilitated by normative frameworks and enforcement mechanisms where the country that receives the investments uh, agrees to somehow let the company that invests have special privileges when it comes to national jurisdiction in case of disputes. And this is what we understand with uh, sort of investment protection mechanisms. So there's a huge de debate around um, investment protection mechanisms, also in transnational and international institutions, in trade-related debates, and also locally in Uruguay. So my main aim is to look at how uh, investments of Finnish forex companies in Uruguay are inserted in a very heated national, international and local debate about their sustainability and their political impact. Well, in the debate in Uruguay about uh, the role of these companies, mostly headquartered in Finland, uh, which is why it's so fascinating, um, has to do with all kinds of power mechanisms. And as a political scientist, I'm um, interested in how, for example, rules about foreign investments could be geared towards more democratic alternatives, because it's it's kind of obvious that there's, a, some could say it's a legitimate trade-off, but there's a clear trade-off, like in order to attract investments, a country typically needs to promise the company something, something that might be problematic for the sort of sovereignty or even of the legal framework of the country in question. Whether this is good or bad is a difficult question because it is a sovereign <laughs> decision of a country to sort of um, let go of some of its sovereignty for example, for the sake of investment protection in order to attract investors. So when there's a debate about potential or alleged environmental harm that the corporation causes in the country, and then, for example, if the local parliament decides to make new rules about environmental protection in name of sustainability, it can become difficult if there are these investment protection rules where the corporation can claim that, oh, your new rules, you're changing the rules of the game and, and it will hurt our interests or it will hurt the stability of the investment environment and you've committed, you, the country, have committed yourself to that kind of stability. And therefore, for any kind of even small scale reform, towards more environmentally friendly legal framework to companies have a mechanism to prevent or at least make the countries doubt. And, and there's something that specialists call the chill effect, like, like uh, 
to tell the country, like, if you do that, we can sue you and we can take you to an arbitration mechanism and it will be very costly. So perhaps the parliamentarians who think in the name of sustainability, we should make new environmental laws. But if we do that, perhaps the company will take us to a mechanism that will be very costly for our country. And actually the company did that in another country or another company did it in our country or whatever. So it makes political decision makers be a little bit hesitant about any kind of transition towards more environmentally friendly uh, sort of legal framework. And therefore the burden of going towards more sustainability is put a little bit more on the shoulders of the corporation and on sort of corporate responsibility frameworks and that the corporations voluntarily become more sustainable and that the corporations voluntarily become more sustainable which of course can happen or sometimes it does sometimes it doesn't but the point here is that corporations don't want binding legal frameworks that make them do things they rather obviously uh, reserve the right to themselves decide uh, what measures to take towards more sustainability. And, and this opens fascinating sort of themes for somebody interested also in democratic theory and scenarios towards more democratic forms of governance. And, and it's obvious from for <laughs> democratic theories, there are many problems in the kind of framework where one actor like big corporations is given the possibility to, to voluntarily uh, define whether something is sustainable or not. Of course, there are all kinds of international sort of frameworks to measure these things. So it's a very messy and complicated things where norm in normative sense, like whether this is good or bad, there are no clear answers. For example, in Uruguay, uh, whether it's good or bad that Finnish companies are there. I don't know. I don't have an answer. I'm researching it. And, and, but it's very heated debate and most people I know tend to have an answer. Some are very heavily against the investments and some are perhaps with some hesitation, but finally very clearly for it in, in Uruguay. And, and uh, it, it's a complex issue. So that's why it's fascinating for so many different reasons. Yeah, in Jurga it's fascinating because apart from the sort of governance, decision-making, democracy, sovereignty and political economy questions that are my expertise, uh, there are questions of environmental impact that I try to understand, but I can't claim to be an expert on what is the impact of eucalyptus plantation on soil or how much of particular substance is harmful when it gets to the river where a pulp mill is located and, and questions like that. So there's the debate about environmental sustainability where as a researcher I can take a stand on, on, on issues that are beyond my expertise of sort of natural science kind, uh, but they are relevant for the kind of decision making that I do study. And then there's um, something people call cultural sustainability uh, uh, and all that. And in a country like Uruguay, that has long traditions of being a republic, and where, for example, cattle and farming have been very important in country's history, even though it's a very urbanized country, but still in the national identity, cattle is... Um, uh, very important. And now there's a situation where lands, some of which used to be for cattle to run around, are now transformed into eucalyptus plantations that are sometimes called forests. Well, you know, there are different names for that. <laughs> Trees <laughs> from afar. In, in Uruguay, I've traveled across the country in actually all the 17 or something departments and the landscape is changing. So for a Finnish person, it sometimes looks pretty familiar, like it looks like forests, even though when you go closer, it's more like plantations, but in any case. So some of the locals are complaining, first they are destroying our traditional landscape. So, uh, and second, 
they are replacing traditional livelihoods, especially uh, farming and cattle, with this eucalyptus used to produce pulp that then goes, for example, to China to produce toilet paper. Um, and, and, and apart from environmental sustainability and debates about impact on democracy and sovereignty, there's this question like, is it somehow harmful as such that the tradition is changing because it is changing? And, and then some people say, no, this is bad because we have our tradition. Then some other people might say, well, there are changes in the countryside and perhaps the traditional elites uh, are being replaced by new systems of production related to eucalyptus and all that. And this is not necessarily only bad for democracy and stuff like that. But is, the, is cultural sustainability a value in itself in the sense that things should remain the same? when the landscape changes and people have perhaps new uh, jobs. There's a big debate about job creation and all that, but let's not go there. Let's assume that, um, that the role of traditional farming and cattle is being replaced by eucalyptus and uh, pulp production as the biggest economic activity of the country. So it sort of changes the, the, also the national identity to some, to some extent. I had fascinating, I was teaching uh, at the main university in Uruguay and sometimes with the students there's, you know, somebody says, yes, this is bad because our cows in Uruguay they are environmentally friendly and do do do. And I'm like, yeah, in Finland, we hear the same thing about our cows. You know, they are environmentally very friendly. All the other cows are the bad cows, but our national cows are good. So it's environmentally good to eat our cows. And in Uruguay, they have a very similar uh, discourse. And then between the students there. So are you saying that, you know, cows and cattle are good for the environment and yes but our cows and and then some people are arguing that defending a tradition based on cattle raising is uh, not necessarily the environmentally most sustainable form of livelihood in the world still it's the tradition and it's the cultural tradition so so there are all kinds of fascinating um, dilemmas there about different dimensions of sustainability. In places like Finland, we think about and approach countries in the global south and in Latin America, there's this stereotype that these countries are often like banana republics where you have like Catholic superstition and all that. And then I look at Uruguay, it's a very modern liberal republic, actually much more than Finland. So if you, if you think like values that in Finland we think, like, oh, we are very modern and sort of liberal republic or whatever. Uh, no, you look from Uruguay, this looks like semi-theocratic kind of place where the role of religion, for example, is in, in uh, parliaments and parliament opens the sessions and people march to church. This is something in Uruguay, they would, what, what? in Finland, that you let the church sort of enter the state in such ways, in, in a true republic, that would never happen. Still, we think of Latin America as something where the church plays a big role and all that. So, and in debate on drugs, drug policies, and how to think about drug policies in human rights terms, Uruguay has been a global vanguard. <laughs> and now similar debates are opening up in Finland. So there are many things we can learn from places like Uruguay. Which means also that when we think about sustainability, we think about foreign investments, we think about the sovereign right of a country to define whether they want some investment or not, we shouldn't infantilize those countries. So I, there are many good and convincing reasons to be critical of many aspects of what Finnish companies do there. 
But then it's also interesting to talk to Uruguayans who say like, okay, but we are sovereign republic and we made the decision that we want these investments. So, so if you say that it's only colonialism, you're sort of infantilizing us because we are not children who, who cannot make decisions. We are, you know, <laughs> compared to Finland, Uruguay is much older republic and all that. So uh, also questioning the right of Uruguayans to decide that they want Finnish corporations opens fascinating uh, questions for the political science. I remember a couple of years ago when the formal investment agreement was signed in um, Uruguay. I was in Finland and then the biggest newspaper of Uruguay calls me and, you know, it's a huge debate in Uruguay and everybody's commenting and then they are, okay, and what's the debate in Finland? And I'm like, you know, Nothing, <laughs> zero, there's nothing in any media, you know. Then the next day there was something, but it's like the Uruguayans were like, oh, it's such a huge thing also for Finland. And yeah, but you know, here people don't pay attention. <laughs> so, uh, but I think it's changing a little bit. Um, it's not only that the biggest investments ever in the history of Uruguay are originated in. Finland, but it's also that the biggest investment ever made by Finnish forestry, which is arguably the most important sector in Finland, is now taking place in Uruguay. So, so the, I think the importance of Uruguay for Finland is becoming uh, a little bit clearer. But the good thing is uh, we have uh, here also at the University of Helsinki, the wonderful colleagues who also worked on Uruguay, and we have really great people and I think perhaps little by little uh, since Finland and Finnish companies seem to be in Uruguay to stay so my guess is that a little by little also we will get more what are people writing their master's thesis or doctoral dissertations and things like that on this fascinating thing about what does presence of Finland or Finnish companies in Uruguay mean for Uruguay and for Finland so, 